Hello and welcome back to Polytoots. In this video we're going to mix it up a little and try something different. I've made a little scene here with the help of my lovely fiance and there's a couple of shader and particle tricks going on so instead of a step-by-step -step guide on how to recreate the effects you see here like the fire, the heat haze distortion stuff, the smoke, the bubbles and the god rays in the window, instead I'll go over how they're made, show the particle system setups and how it all ties together and obviously I'll explain what's happening in the shaders too but that's about it. This little witch's room and all the particles and shaders are freely available over on my Patreon if you wanted to just grab the package for yourself and have a look. I just keep in mind that this is using the universal render pipeline, though I am positive that it will work fine on legacy and HDRP if you were to remake it. I mean, I think if you just import the package into a different render pipeline, it won't work, but I don't know. One last thing to note is I will be using the Amplify Shader editor for this, but you can follow along with Shader Graph if you're familiar with it. For now, let's go ahead and I'll show you how I built the particles for the fire and the smoke. There's nothing super special happening here, so I'm just getting it out of the way first. The fire itself is crazy simple. I've kept the lifetime low because I don't want a fire particle to last too long. I've taken the speed down to zero because I'll just use a bit of uh, minus gravity to control this in the end. The shape I set to a circle as that matches best for the fire pit this is going into, and I wanted all of the flames to start from the, uh, the same point on the ground. Color over lifetime is a good parameter to pay attention to if you don't want your particles popping in and out of existence. Just edit the alpha so it starts off invisible and ends invisible. Now I'll tweak the gravity so the particles go up a bit and change the size of a lifetime so they get progressively smaller. There's also rotation over lifetime but at the moment with the default material we're not going to see any difference because it's just this circle. So it's time to change the material and for now I'll use one I've made just to get something on screen and start tinkering with that rotation stuff and rotation of a lifetime, you know, the star rotation and rotation of a lifetime. And uh, making some other small tweaks here and there now that I can actually see the texture on screen. And here's the first hot tip, I suppose. That wasn't supposed to be a pun, but oh well. Um, I'm using my own basic shader setup here to allow for bloom on my particles, meaning it works when you're using uh, a bloom post-processing effect because by default, the particle system does not allow colors to go into the HDR range, which means no bloom. But the thing to notice here is I can still change the color of these particles and it updates as you would expect it to. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because with recent Unity versions, they do offer particle materials that have an emission. But the completely wacko thing about them is the emission color on these particle materials will override the color on your particle, which means if you want multiple colors of the same effect, you can't just change it in the particle system. You need to create a whole new material like with the colors that you want. That's an odd choice in my opinion, uh, so I still stick with my own shaders for this. Speaking of which, let's just go take a look at this emissive particle setup. Pretty basic as you can see, a regular unlit transparent shader. It's essentially just a texture and a color being multiplied by a vertex color node. So it's RGBA for the color and A for the alpha. This is important because the way the Unity particle system handles color and alpha is via vertex colors. The next important thing is the color node itself. Make sure it has the HDR range enabled as this allows you to access the color's intensity, which is what the bloom needs to know in order to define how glowy something will be, and you'll never get hired by Blizzard if you don't harness the power of glowy things. That's that for the fire, so now we'll move on to the smoke, and in the name of efficiency, I'm just going to change the behavior of the fire particle that we've got here, rather than make a whole new one. So I'm just simplifying things for the most part, changing the start size to a constant, getting rid of size over lifetime, lowering the emission amount, and increasing its lifetime. I think I was also supposed to ditch the rotation over lifetime, but it looks like past me is equally as stupid as current me. I think I changed these things later though, so that's fine. There's no special shader for this at all. I am just using a default particle material, but the loveliness comes from this flipbook texture which is a free download on the Unity blog. They've got quite a lot of cool smoke and fire texture sheets, so definitely worth grabbing those and having a play. I will leave a link in the description. If we slap this material onto our particles, you'll notice that we're looking at all of the frames as a single texture. So we need to enable the texture sheet animation parameter and we have to tell it how many rows and columns are in this texture. You can just count them manually, but the folks at Unity have been nice enough to add the correct amount as a name suffix, which honestly is a habit more people need to get into. 
Once that's on though, I go back through the settings and start simplifying a bit more. We don't need start rotations or random rotations of a lifetime. The color needs to change and I drop the alpha down too. And that's basically it. The texture is doing all the hard work here. And if you wanted to make your own flipbooks like these, you know, like with smoke and fire, explosions or whatever, uh, I recommend looking into the likes of Embergen, which isn't free, or even Blender, which is free, and that has some pretty cool gas, fire, smoke, liquid simulation stuff. For a free software, it's definitely pretty cool. Not something that I'm going to dive into right now, but you basically just create your simulation in whatever you're using and then render it out as frames. And then you put these frames together and that's your flipbook texture sheet. For us though, we're done with the smoke and it's time to reveal probably the coolest effect I've seen in a long time. And that's the heat distortion. Now I know this looks like a regular refraction style of shader, but some absolute genius by the name of Psy over on the Amplify Discord just casually dropped this golden nugget down in the user contributions channel. It's a shader function that fixes a very common issue. So I'll start off by showing you the issue and that's all made with the nodes up here, which I think is probably the most common and or easiest way to do a screen based distortion. At least it's the way I've always done it, but that's not saying much, I guess. You can see here that we still have our distortion happening. It's definitely stronger than what was there before, but there's also one major annoying feature we've got and that's that we're distorting the whole screen, meaning even objects in front of our heat haze will get distorted. So, so let me just go all blue Peter here and I'll grab this cylinder that I prepared for this demonstration. You can see that this is just not nice. Like nobody wants this, nobody asked for this. You can probably guess what this shader function is going to fix, but before the magic is revealed, I just wanted to say that Sai has also got a version of this for ShaderGraph. Though it's not something in my possession and I have no idea if I can share it or not. So the best I can do is to tell you all to go over to the Amplify Discord. I will have a link in the description. Find a user called Sai, that's S-A-I, and politely request the ShaderGraph version if that's what you're after. One thing to mention about this function is that your URP or HDRP settings need the depth and opaque textures enabled. There's also one more setting to look into here, but we'll get to that in about 20 seconds. So let's finally apply the shader function and take a look. Though you might notice there's still some minor artifacts, and honestly, depending on your use case, this might be fine, but if you did want to get rid of these entirely, then you'll need to go back to the URP or HDRP settings and disable downsampling. Now, the thing with downsampling is it renders your scene at like twice or more of your resolution and then lowers it back down to match your resolution. So, you know, if it renders it twice, it will then halve it. This produces nice smooth results. And this is what you'll be getting rid of in favor of fixing those minor distortion glitches. I leave the choice entirely up to you. If you are still using the legacy rendering pipeline, then the good news is you don't need to do this. Um, it just works. So yeah, I recommend grabbing this function and uh, checking it out. So that's it for the magical distortion. Uh, I wanted to show it off in my next water tutorial as nobody looking for fixed water refraction is going to think about finding it in this video, but now oh well, it will be in my next water tutorial anyway. So, you know, win win. Oh, actually, one last thing is that I've added in a circular gradient alpha mask for the distortion particles. You could add this as a texture rather than doing it with math in the shader, but Doing it this way does mean that you can use any other normals texture and it will always be masked out if you happen to forget to uh, include a mask. The reason I do this is because without it, you're going to get an obvious cutoff point where the particle planes are ending or where they're meeting or, you know, rendering in front of each other and things like that. You could maybe get around this by using a stretch trail particle instead of spawning a lot of planes, but the problem with the trails is they will only exist for as long as the particle it's following and heat haze tends to rise, you know, higher above than everything else. Next up, we'll take a look at these little bubbles in the pot. Again, this is using a particle system, but this time we're using a custom mesh, which is just a, uh, a basic sphere that's been cut off and had the bottom edges scaled a bit. Uh, I was doing this, all of this in Blender, but you know, this is not a Blender tutorial. The most important part here is the very specific set of UVs that, that this has. It's quite important that the UVs fit in the zero to one space because we're going to be using a tiling noise texture. It doesn't need to tile from top to bottom uh, as that's the direction that the other uh, bubble will pop in, but the left and right sides should match seamlessly. Otherwise, you know, we're gonna get a seam. 
Although I doubt anyone will notice on like an object of this size, but it's still good to do things the right way. If we take a look at this material, you'll see that there's only a noise texture in here. There are no controls for anything else, at least not any front facing controls. So if I just grab our bubble mesh on its own here and drag it into the scene, I'm going to give it the same material and you'll notice that pretty much nothing is happening here. It's just it's flat and it's gray and it's boring. And this is because the color and alpha info is being driven by the particle system. So if we go and open up this shader, you'll see the familiar vertex color node being used here. So that's RGBA for the color and A for the alpha. So my entire albedo is just a color multiplied by a Fresnel node. For the bubble popping action, we're using an alpha cutoff and we're doing it from the top to the bottom of our object's UVs. So that's why we have these additional UV coordinates being subtracted and one minus. It's creating the alpha mask that we're adding over the top of our noise texture. The way to tell the shader we want to use cutoff alpha instead of a fade alpha is to leave the shader surface as opaque, but add in a value here for the alpha clip threshold. I first had this as a property just so I could get a value that made sense with my mask and the timings and stuff, but we'll cover like the timings of things later. Uh, and after that though, I turned it into a constant. so it didn't exist on the material anymore because there was no need to change it. This can be quite confusing as it kind of gives you two ways to control your alpha, but just think of the threshold as like a limit basically, uh, and your actual controls for the alpha should be via the slot that is just called alpha. To give you an example of how this popping works on the particle, I'm going to come to the end of my alpha chain here and just temporarily multiply it by a property value. Now if we come back to our mesh, we have this new property here, and if I start to take it from 0 to 1 and back again, you'll see that our mask is working wonders. So this is what we're controlling on the particle with its color and thus alpha over lifetime. Pretty sweet. I'm just going to remove those example nodes now and quickly run through recreating this particle system. I hope the speed of this is fine, remember that this whole package is freely downloadable on my Patreon if you wanted to see the specific values, but the general idea is to create a bunch of particles spawning in a circle that start teeny tiny, they get bigger and then alpha out. And there's only a few things to keep in mind with this and the first one is we're obviously wanting to use our custom mesh, so we need to set that in the renderer tab and make sure to assign our bubble mesh. The particles will still be trying to face the camera though, so make sure you set the render alignment to either world or local. If you're doing this on other meshes and it's also coming in with the wrong rotation, you can change the 3D start rotation up at the top to fix this. I've slapped on a random material for now just to make this easier to see. Next up we'll change the size over lifetime to just scale up as time goes on and already this is looking pretty bubbly wobbly. Now, I'll throw on our custom shader and start messing with the alpha, which we control with the color over lifetime property. If I just set the end to have an alpha of zero, you can get the idea here. It works fine, but the timing is a little off. You want those bubbles to really pop out of existence. So add in a full alpha point and move it like higher up until you're happy with the timings. One other subtle thing you can do is to time the size over lifetime with the alpha that we're using to cut it off. So we can add in our own points for the size and start changing it so the bubbles quickly grow bigger for like an instant right before the alpha cuts them off. Uh, this makes for a better popping visual in my opinion. And then lastly, of course, we can change the color and if you're using a value that isn't just a bright white, then the Fresnel rim lighting will also be visible too. I'd almost completely forgotten about that. And that is that for the bubbles. There's only one more thing left, and it's the god rays in the window, which are pretty simple, but look wonderful in my opinion. There is some subtle movement happening across the texture here, but the mesh itself was created by just extruding some edges out from, a, uh, from the window in Blender. Uh, and then I made sure the UVs were filling the UV space, and in this example, they're mapped horizontally which is important to know because we want our texture streaks to be in the right orientation. But you know, if you are doing it the other way around, then that's fine because it just, it just means you'll swap some values around later. If we open up the shader here and see what's going on, the first thing you'll probably notice is the streaky texture. This is actually just the same noise texture we were using on the bubbles, but I've just changed the UVs so its tiling amount is super low on the X. I've also used a panner node here just to give it some soft movement. 
For everything else you see here, uh, if we go to the material, there are some controls for the color, the length, which obviously you can only go as far as the mesh allows, the strength, which is simply controlling the alpha over the entire thing, and the power, which might be confusing, but it basically determines how thick or dense or opaque the light is at the closest point to the window. So if I just go into the shader real quick here, this might make more sense. If I start increasing the power range here, you can see the effect it's having. Like we still have our gradient from the noise, but the power range is able to move across it from the right. And while we're here, I'll just point out the strength property. It's at the end of the chain before the alpha slot, so it ultimately controls the total alpha, meaning if your strength is at zero, then it doesn't matter how much power you have, everything will be invisible. And then lastly, the length property here. Uh, it's just a subtraction of the U coordinate to create that horizontal mask. Again, similar to the power property, but the length causes the total mask to move, whereas the power just affects the mask once its length is already set and the strength can override both of them. <laughs> I, I hope that makes sense because, you know, that's, that's the end of the tutorial or whatever this is. Before I go, I do just want to give a shout out to my amazing Patreons. I genuinely appreciate the support, especially because I give most of my stuff away. And for everyone else, I thank you very much just for watching. So uh, be sure to check the links in the description for the um, uh, Amplify Discord, the Unity blog with the flipbook textures, uh, my Patreon, of course, my Twitter and anything else that I've forgotten. But uh, yeah, that will be all. So thank you very much and I will see you in the next one.